viewpoint. I'm Chris Kenny. We're going to catch up now with the shadow, not, not the shadow, the assistant treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, who joins us live from Melbourne. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Be with you, Chris. Look, I promised I wouldn't ask you about the Royal Baby, so I should ask you who's <laughs> going to win the gold luggy tonight. <laughs> oh, <laughs> No. I, don't even know who, I don't even know who the contenders are. That's right. Maybe the, that guy from the block, maybe. The, the important people are still on TV tonight, mate. Look, I, <laughs> I, I, I want to get in, in, into the budget uh, and the preparations for it. We heard a lot of talk in the lead-up to the last budget, probably not early enough before the last budget, but the, there was talk about spending being the problem, and there's major reform in that, uh, in that budget, and we know, all know a lot of that reform has failed. Now, is spending still the key problem? Is the government going to focus in this budget, in its second budget, budget in cutting spending or are you going to look at raising extra revenue? Well certainly we are looking to cut spending and we did that in our first budget and 75% of those measures went through the Senate and a number of them didn't and uh, we're still dealing with the aftermath of the Senate's obstructionism and Labor's failure to even support five billion dollars worth of measures that they took to the last election but are now refusing to pass and another 30 billion dollars worth of savings measures are stuck in the in the Senate. But we also have to understand that monetary policy is trying to stimulate the economy with low interest rates and we want fiscal policy and monetary policy to work hand in glove as Glenn Stevens has called for and so therefore the path of fiscal consolidation will be slower than perhaps uh, we saw in our first budget but no doubt it will continue as we reduce um, the rate of spending growth that we inherited from Labor. Well, I'll come back to that in a moment, but on the, uh, in terms of revenue and raising extra funds, are you looking at a Netflix or Google, Google tax to try and uh, take more revenue from major multinationals, particularly operating in the digital space? We are looking at a number of um, measures on the revenue side, but they're about the integrity of our tax system. You see, when it comes to a Netflix or a Google or an Uber or an Airbnb, they're importing what are called intangible services um, from offshore into Australia. Now they're not subject in many cases to the GST, so that's putting at a disadvantage domestic providers of very similar services. So we are looking um, to create a level playing field, that's why we're working through the international processes, particularly through the OECD. Yeah, that's uh, going to Chris. take a long time though. Are you actually going that to have is. measures in this budget that attack that issue? There will be measures in this budget that do deal with multinationals and do strengthen the integrity of our tax system, particularly when you're looking at this digital and e-commerce space. All right. Um, also on that, I wonder whether you're doing anything to look at some of those organisations that fall outside the tax regime. I'm thinking of unions and industry associations, <laughs> business associations, uh, uh, others in the not-for-profit not sector that are not taxed. And, and there's two problems with that. You, you've got a Royal Commission going into uh, union corruption. One of the things of having these organisations inside the taxation net is it gives the taxation office a chance to uh, uh, another organisation that can look at the integrity of their finances, if you like. But also mm. there must be a, a massive amount of revenue uh, potential in this area. And as I say, it's employer organisations as well as unions. And there, there's, there, there is the potential there for rorting uh, through those tax-exempt status they have. Well, you're right that the unions uh, do get off scot-free when it comes to the tax system. Um, unlike the Labor Party, we don't go for revenue grabs for the sake of just making the budget look better. We try to strengthen the integrity of our tax system. That, that's why we released a white paper. But what we are looking at, for example, when it comes to the not-for-profits, um, is a particular FBT concession that applies to people who work in um, certain benevolent institutions or also in the uh, health space where they get an unlimited uh, amount to, to spend on hospitality and meals and entertainment that are not subject to the normal uh, FBT processes. Now, um, we understand the rationale for those concessions being given, namely to allow those organisations to attract better people uh, without having to pay the same wages as they would do in the private sector. But there's also an integrity measure here because the previous Labor government was advised that that particular concession uh, needed 
uh, to be brought within the broader concessional cap and not be left uncapped because there was rorting and people, Chris, dare I say it, were paying for their 40th birthdays or were paying for their overseas holidays or were taking all their mates out for dinner and getting a tax benefit as a result. That's so, not fair to other taxpayers. So let's just crystallise that. You're saying in the budget there will be a measure that limits the fringe benefits tax exemptions in the not-for-profit not sector, in, in the charity sector and the like? We're, we're not looking to get rid of that altogether, um, but we are looking at putting a cap on um, some of those concessions that are available. And that's simply to create a fairer system and indeed, dare I say it, leaders in the not-for-profit sector, like the head of Save the Children, like uh, the, uh, Tim Costello from uh, World Vision, they've all said that this is a practice, this tax concession is one that should stop. All right, now just moving on to the, the bigger picture of the budget, we were talking before about this path back to surplus and you were talking about making sure you keep monetary and fiscal policy on track. What I want to point out tonight, of course, is that there was a, a lot of talk about a budget crisis, a budget emergency in the lead up to, to the election and, and the, the Abbott government's first budget. Uh, if anything, the situation since then has gotten worse with global uncertainty and uh, lower economic growth in this country than was expected. Yet we're seeing a situation where all the expectations are going the other way, that Tony Abbott is talking about a softer kind of budget. Here's what he said yesterday about what we should expect in this year's budget. I want to assure people, I want to assure you that this is a budget that will be uh, measured, responsible and fair. It's a budget that will be good for jobs, growth and opportunity. It'll be a budget which is good for confidence. Well, Josh Frydenberg, isn't this a case of uh, Tony Abbott, the government, yourself, Joe Hockey, walking away from fiscal reform, deciding that it is too hard in this political environment and you're actually just going to take your time when it comes to fixing the budget? Well, there's some important points to make here. The first point is we didn't create this fiscal mess. Uh, in fact, Kevin Rudd inherited a pristine balance sheet from John Howard and Peter Costello. They had the five, Labor had the five biggest budget deficits in Australia's history. We were uh, sent as a country onto a trajectory of $667 billion worth of debt and now we're paying more than a billion dollars a, year, uh, a yeah, month but, in interest but just the on point, that debt. But the, point, the is, but the point. point is you haven't yeah. been able to improve that situation no, in your first 18 true. months, yet you're already easing off. No, well, that is absolutely not true, Chris. The second point is, as the IGR has shown, we have halved the debt trajectory that we inherited through the legislated measures, not the announced measures, the actual legislated measures. Now, if we were to get through some of our announced measures, we would reduce that trajectory even further. Now, there's still more to be done, and we are very focused on that. Where you will see important announcements in, this, in the budget uh, for the following week, are around boosting participation in the workforce. That's what the childcare announcement is about. You know, the Productivity Commission found that there were 165,000 Australian parents that would enter the workforce if they could access more affordable childcare. We're trying to do that with our announcements. And in fact, today, we've announced $840 million for additional um, school care, uh, preschool care for, for four-year-olds and kindergarten. A very I'll come, significant back, I'll come back to that uh, child care issue in a moment because uh, people are very interested in that, of course, and as you say, it's yeah. going to be a, a centre point of, of, the, of the budget. But the, the key point I wanted to focus on here is the fact that there were major reforms put up in the last budget in the Medicare co-payments, in the higher mm -hmm. education reform, in the changes to uh, doll payments and eligibility. You've run into political trouble with all of that and obviously that's manifested itself in a leadership crisis for Tony Abbott in February. Is it not the case now that all these political considerations are taking precedence? We're now seeing a very, we're looking at seeing a very political budget that is one that doesn't offend anybody rather than the one of fiscal repair which by the government's own rhetoric is the one the, gov uh, the, the country badly needs. Well I don't think you'll hold that view when you see Joe Hockey deliver the budget on the 12th of May. I mean, take for example the pension issue, you're right, we were stopped in the Senate from changing the indexation on the pension and now we're looking at alternative paths and ACOS have put up a proposal which Scott Morrison has engaged deeply with. On higher education, 
We've been blocked uh, a number of times with those reforms, those savings and the ability to deregulate the high the, the university market. We're not backing away from those reforms. We continue to prosecute them. So um, some, like the Medicare co-payment, we have dropped, but others uh, we continue to prosecute. So we are absolutely committed to fixing Labor's mess, but we also have to be practical and pragmatic looking at what the Senate can actually pass. Well, I'll tell you who else is being practical and pragmatic about how to fix Labor's mess, and that's the Labor Party. Let's just have a quick look yeah. at what uh, Chris Bowen, the former Treasurer, now Shadow Treasurer, had to say this morning on Sky News. We will have more savings than spending uh, over the decade, and we believe that there needs to be a decade-focused strategy on the budget. This is consistent with what Glenn Stevens has said, what Martin Parkinson has said just in recent days, that there shouldn't be a headlong rush to get to rush back to surplus within the next couple of years. Well, Josh Frydenberg, you've got the uh, shadow treasurer there, Chris Bowen, basically agreeing with you that you've got to take a steady-as-she-goes approach. This is what worries me. You've got both sides of politics not in a hurry to fix the budget mess. And uh, I've pointed out the rhetoric that uh, the coalition has used over the past couple of years about the urgency of the fiscal problem. Crisis, emergency is what some people have called it. But, of course, by Labor's own reckoning, this needed fixing and could have been fixed. Remember, only in 2012, of Wayne Swan announced a budget surplus, not only one, he announced four budget surpluses. So obviously even by Labor's reckoning, this government, this budget should be further down the path towards uh, returning, to, uh, returning to a surplus. The key here is to look what Labor does, not what look at Labor says, because as you, say, as you have made clear, Chris, they have, they've announced budget surpluses that they've never delivered. And in this Labor's year of big ideas, they've announced no savings measures whatsoever. They've announced two additional tax increases, but have failed to release the workings of those documents and the Parliamentary Budget Office's preparation there. And just this morning on Sky, Chris Bowen was all over the place admitting that his increased tax on superannuation savings was going to hurt many more of the 60, than 60,000 people they initially had projected. In fact, it will hurt pensioners and it will target the middle class. So we are being criticised for putting up savings to the, to the Senate that are not getting through. Labor's not even putting up any savings whatsoever and is just talking about uh, a mythical surplus that they hope to deliver sometime into the future. Yeah, we'll follow up on that. I don't think it's sustainable for them. Just a couple of points before you go. We mentioned childcare. There's a lot of suggestion, well, uh, really uh, some information coming out from Scott Morrison, the Social Services Minister, about how childcare arrangements will be tightened up. It'll be better targeted at lower income and middle income families. This will mean, won't it, that uh, mothers, families on higher incomes are, 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 going to get, are going to lose out. You are going to have losers in this budget at the threshold of those childcare arrangements. Well, when you see how much money, new money, is being spent on childcare, I think you'll agree that there are all winners uh, in this childcare debate. And we are using the Productivity Commission as our guide, Chris. Um, there's some very useful uh, policy uh, suggestions in there that um, Scott Morrison has taken up and our single goal here is to try to get more women into the workforce and to create more affordable and accessible childcare and I think you'll see that the measures on uh, Tuesday May the 12th do exactly that. All right, I just want to get to you on uh, foreign policy as well. You've got a strong background in foreign affairs, having worked for the uh, Foreign Minister Alexander Downer, having advised John Howard on uh, international security issues. What is your assessment of the relationship, the extent of the damage done to the relationship with Indonesia over the execu execution of the two Australians, and how long will it take to get the relationship back on track. That's largely in Australia's hands. What sort of a period do you expect the Australian government to keep Indonesia in the cooler, if you like? Well, I think the relationship has been bruised, but I doubt that Australia will take any further punitive measures against Indonesia, uh, given that we have uh, recalled our ambassador, which was a significant step. Um, I do feel very disappointed in the way Indonesia has dealt with this issue. Um, they have more than 200 of their own citizens who are on death row around the world. They seek clemency for those citizens and they couldn't find it in their heart to give clemency to these two Australians who are clearly rehabilitated. 
I also note that um, uh, the president of Indonesia, Jokowi, um, went against the advice that he, from his vice president, Yusuf Kala, uh, against uh, advice from uh, the former president, Cecilio Bangbang Yudhiyono, and from his presidential opponent, Prabowo, uh, and their reports to that, to that effect. So I was obviously very disappointed in this outcome, but I think Tony Abbott and Julie Bishop have kept a focus on the bigger picture here, which is the broader Australia-Indonesia relationship. We both need each other. We are both friends with each other. Um, there's a very important strategic cooperation taking place, and I really hope that the relationship gets back to that strong level footing that it was on private, previous to this very unfortunate development. Well, just on that, what about uh, what I think is a crazy decision by the Australian Catholic University to name a scholarship for Indonesian students coming to Australia in honour of Andrew Chan and, um, and uh, Sukumaran. And um, these, uh, the Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumaran scholarships will be supposedly targeted promoting the sanctity of life. Now, I think this is a silly decision, but won't this be viewed very poorly in Indonesia? In very much a, a, a snub at their attitude and an antagonistic move from, a, from an Australian university. Look, I hope not. I mean, universities will do some strange things uh, uh, from time to time. As you know, you only have to look at the BDS boycott taking place in Sydney and uh, look this raised a few eyebrows but um, I'm, I'm not going to criticise Chris, uh, Greg Craven and, and the ACU for that decision because that is their decision to take other than to say it is really important that um, both Indonesia and Australia focus on the broader relationship uh, because uh, as a country of 240 million people in Indonesia um, and a country that has been a good friend of Australia, um, we, we do need that relationship to, uh, to be on an even keel. All right, Josh Friedberg, thanks for joining us again on Viewpoint. Nice to be with you, Chris. That was the Assistant Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. Now, he doesn't want to criticise the Australian Catholic University too much on this issue. These scholarships, I think it's madness to name these scholarships after the executed Australians, and we'll take that up with the panel after the break. Miranda Devine and Samantha Maiden.